of other other uh, countries and our expert you will uh, follow our our uh, experts so second one uh, will take place take uh, place uh, andrei kohut uh, director of the archives of security services services of ukraine thank you дякую доброго вечора всім власне тут ми зустрічаємося з нашими колегами з країн Центральної і Східної Європи не вперше, і е, якщо раніше ми зустрічалися і говорили про ті моменти, коли е, нам була цікава, нам була важлива е, історія, досвід власне Чехії, Польщі, країн Балтії, то зараз також і Україна вже є однією з тих країн, яка також може розказувати, показувати, демонструвати і свій досвід, свій досвід стосовно переходу від тоталітарного посттоталітарного суспільства до демократичного. Звичайно, ми зараз не можемо говорити про те, що цей перехід вже повністю відбувся, але поза тим ми також маємо ряд певних важливих змін, які також можуть бути корисними і цікавими для наших колег з країн Центральної і Східної Європи. Загалом, коли ми говоримо про політику пам'яті, то перше, що може спасти на думку, це те, що в першу чергу це те, що стосується минулого. І як би не було парадоксально, політика пам'яті це насправді не зовсім про минуле, це насправді про майбутнє. І власне, коли ми говоримо про політику пам'яті, то якби, ціль цієї політики пам'яті є якраз майбутнє. Коли ми, в принципі, говорили і постійно говоримо про перехід, <кій> трансформацію, транзит суспільство від, суспільства від суспільства закритого типу, таким як це було суспільство, якщо ми говоримо про Україну в Радянському Союзі, і це також є вірним для країн Центральної і Східної Європи, для країн Балтії, Польщі, Чехії, до країн так званого відкритого суспільства, відкритого типу, то, власне, потрібно розуміти, що цей перехід, цей транзит, він не є автоматичним. Звичайно, дуже часто на хвилі кольорових революцій, на хвилі революційних змін кінця 80-х, початку 90-х років, багатьом видавалося, що, власне, самої зміни режиму може бути достатньо для того, щоб зміни відбулися і стали незворотніми. На жаль, як ми могли побачити пізніше з, і, з історії України, з нашої нещодавньої історії, е, автоматизму тут немає. Не відбувається ніщо само по собі, не, недостатньо тільки, щоб відбулася зміна влади і посади у виконавчій, законодавчій владі посіли ті, хто презентує, представляє демократичні сили. І, власне, для того, щоб зміни відбулися і стали незворотніми, для цього потрібна реалізація певної політики. І можна по-різному це називати, хтось говорить про модернізацію, хтось говорить про реформи, і все це є вірно, але разом з тим також потрібно розуміти, що економічні реформи, модернізація індустрії, вони є тільки одним із частин тих змін, які насправді потребує суспільство. І коли ми говоримо про зміни в гуманітарному плані, то тут якраз розбудова відкритого суспільства неможлива без переосмислення, переоцінки тоталітарного минулого. І це, власне, те, що називається в англійській мові «dealing with the past», це якраз те, що є конче необхідне для того, щоб зміни відбулися і стали можливими. Ми можемо багато дискутувати, що є початком, що є причиною, а що є базисом. Економічна основа чи гуманітарна якби надбудова, як говорили марксисти, чи навпаки. Хто би яку позицію не приймав, як на мене є очевидним те, що одне без іншого не матиме жодного результату. І, власне, коли ми говоримо про дороговкази свободи, коли ми говоримо про демократичні зміни, то якраз значення політики пам'яті тут є ключовим. Отож, що, би, що взагалі входить в політику пам'яті, в різних країнах є свої, свої інструменти, свої, тих, свої набори тих відповідей, які даються в рамках політики пам'яті, і, звичайно ж, вони залежать від, того, від, від особливостей кожної країни. 
Є така приказка, що всі щасливі люди виглядають однаково. Коли ми говоримо про суспільство, то так само можна сказати, що всі ті суспільства, які ми вважаємо більш-менш благополучними, щасливими, вони виглядають однаково, але кожне суспільство нещасливе по-своєму. Попри те, що в країнах колишнього соцтабору чи комуністичного, <кій> комуністичних країнах, де панував більшовизм, попри те, що начебто система була та сама, Бу, є, були і були певні відмінності, і ці певні відмінності спричинили також те, що політика пам'яті в наших країнах відрізняється тим набором інструментів, які використовуються. Можна перерахувати, власне, що мається на увазі, вже як Павло про це говорив, і також мені, як директору, арх... директору архіву, хотілося б в першу чергу. І тут ми говоримо про те, що важливо на перших порах не дати можливості е, тим людям, які будуть саботувати просто цей транзит, далі залишатися біля керма е, держави. І є відомий вислів е, Вацлава Гавела, тут ми знову повертаємося до чеського досвіду, який говорив, що краще 5 років помилок, ніж 50 років саботажу, коли його питали, чому він е, більш заангажований в те, щоб брати нових людей, котрі не мають досвіду в керуванні державою. Наступним пунктом, який також пов'язаний з архівами, це відкриття тих сторінок історії, котрі були раніше невідомі або були заборонені. І коли ми говоримо про Україну, то надзвичайно важливим є такі сторінки історії, як Українська революція 17-21 року, селянське повстання, голодомор, спротив радянській владі і спроби встановлення радянської Антикомунізм момент on the uh, west of Ukraine. And when we are talking about opening of these pages of history, the important uh, issue is to conduct wide campaigns, wide informational campaigns, which can uh, make the society aware of uh, of the closed pages of the history. Depending on how long the totalitarian, the totalitarian regime um, was uh, in, that, uh, in this or that country, when we are talking about Ukraine, it is uh, uh, s uh, about three generations. It is important to... It is important that people, uh, as a rule, uh, the majority knows uh, the history from the uh, books of history at school. Ми говоримо про Україну, про порадянських підручниках, комуністичних підручниках. Якщо ми говоримо про Україну, люди знають того, що насправді відбувалося. Від Совєтбукс, і вони не знають, що відбувалося в реаліті. Це тому, що відбування 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 which concern those places where repressions took place. It is also very important. It is also very important. Це це є надзвичайно важливим елементом власне політики. Very important element of the policy of the memory policy. Можливо, навіть не елемент, а one of the latest, maybe not even elements, but what is very what is essential to implement the memory policy is creation of institutions which have to implement this policy. Perhaps it is a not full sequence of instruments which are important to implement the policy of memory. Here it is very... We should understand that the policy of memory is essential and important at the moment of transition. And it is necessary to understand that the policy of memory is connected with transitional justice. The moment when the society needs to adopt some laws which maybe it will not be necessary in the everyday life. Uh, one of them is illustration. When we are talking about the memory policy and Ukraine, unfortunately, 
From the beginning of the restoration of independence of Ukraine, uh, this uh, memory policy um, wasn't implemented, and it led to the fact that at the beginning of the 90s years, uh, there was some um, like hidden compromise between the um, representatives of uh, people movement and uh, the representatives of communist uh, authority. Um, the popular movement um, hoped that the authority that the authority will give all rights to people. And uh, I have mentioned it uh, earlier. After the last uh, revolution in Ukraine in the 14th, in 2014, uh, the policy of memory became realistic. Uh, there were some efforts in 2008-10 uh, when Yushchenko was uh, the head of the country and there were some results if we are talking about uh, about uh, the adoption of uh, Holodomor as a genocide. Uh, when the archives became to be opened and after 2014 it became possible to implement the reform of Ukrainian institution of national remembrance. It was uh, established as, an, as a governmental body. There were four decommunization laws were adopted. In fact, uh, these are not the all um, laws we need. Uh, we need uh, a law on re rehabilitation because the adopted rehabilitation law was adopted on the last moment of the existence uh, of USSR. And that is why it doesn't uh, include many criteria of those people who, um, who would have been re rehabilitated, by, but they are not rehabilitated because uh, they were um, they opposed the regime of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, they fought for independence of Ukraine. So that is why they um, didn't. They were not rehabilitated. Uh, we opened the archives of uh, political secret, serv uh, secret services, and we can work with them now. So these uh, steps were taken. These are the steps we took, and uh, moreover, uh, we cleared the public society from the symbols of totalitarian regime, and these are the elements which had to be uh, provided uh, from the side of governmental institutions. But we should uh, remember that the important part of uh, the realization of um, memory policy um, are not only governmental, but is when we are talking about wide information campaigns, first of all, we should mention um, responsibility and key tasks for academic institutions, universities, museums, and uh, different memorials and non-governmental campaigns that uh, can the opportunity to uh, have a wide access to society and can tell them about the earlier hidden uh, historical events. <coughs> and finally, uh, it is necessary to remember and understand that the aim of uh, memory policy is uh, a formation of s uh, such society where uh, any repetition of totalitarian uh, practices or returning to uh, some totalitarian regime will be impossible. And from this point of view, it is very important to implement the memory policy and uh, and to discuss, it is important to discuss uh, to discuss this issue and uh, to invite uh, the colleagues and experts from Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, as the late history shows, there is no um, this situation is not finished. This um, our co collaboration, um, exchange of experience should take place and. 
Every time we encounter new problems, new issues, and this conference is an effort to continue looking for uh, answers, how to better realize, implement the policy of memory in order to reach all um, aims. Thank you. Я думаю, що це просто історія без кінця щодо цього переходу, щодо люстрації. І це є причиною, чому ми всі сьогодні зібрались. Тому що дуже важливо ділитися інформацією, ділитися досвідом. Я рада, що можу що ми можемо почати розмовляти розмову про естонський досвід. І я хочу надати слово Томасу Гію. Дорогі what happened in Estonia between 1944-45 to 1991. But before that, we had in Estonia uh, an institution with a very long name, Estonian International Commission for the Investigation of Crimes Against Humanity, founded in uh, 1998. And uh, this institution had to make clear what happened in Estonia, more or less during uh, the first Soviet occupation from 1940 to 1941, then during German occupation, and uh, then uh, during post-war Stalinist period. But the first lists of deported people and other victims of uh, communist uh, regime were published already before the official independence of Estonia in 91. The first lists were compiled and published in the end of 1980s and in 1990. Next. So, but mm, to the topic, T democracy matters, but uh, democracy is not enough. We know that many dictators were and are democratically elected. And uh, the border between democracy and populism is very thin, as we can see also in contemporary world. And uh, we know also that democracy does not work without strong, strong institutions based on rule of law. So parliament and president could be democratically elected, but it does not mean that there is also a rule of law in this country. <coughs> Another point here is, uh, uh, when we are looking to history, uh, and it is always politically used, that communist dictatorships are identical. It's true, they seem to have been identical but we as historians know that each nation had its 
own unique experience. For example, Soviet Union in Estonia was very much different as the Soviet Union was in, for example, Tajikistan. And therefore, it is also true that experience of one nation could not be copied by another nation and in another time. But we can learn, of course, always from the mistakes of our colleagues in the other countries. Next, please. So, a little bit about Estonian history, because uh, how communist system worked in Estonia from 1940 to 1991 was connected to Estonian history anyway. For Estonians, it's very important that we had independent statehood from 1918 to 1940. And Estonia was one of the member states of uh, League of Nations. So Ukraine was founding member of United Nations, but Estonia was not then member of United Nations anymore because Estonian independence was not restored after World War II. Uh, though our strengths between the, you know, during interwar period, belonged that our population was relatively mono-ethnic. 88% of uh, population of Estonia were Estonians in 1940, 1934. And also the level of literacy was high. There was about more than 90% of Estonians uh, were literate in the end of 19th century. And we have no essential territorial disputes with neighboring countries today. Our national ethnic identity was created since 19, 1860s, but, and it was strongly opposing Germans and Russians. And Estonia belongs, Estonians belong to the peasant nations of Eastern Europe, so, so most of Estonians were peasants in the end of First World War. Upper class comprised mostly of a very small Baltic German community, and uh, Estonians were landowners, mm, beginning with the uh, 1860s, but uh, our land reform was carried through in 1919, and uh, big land ownership was abolished. So the big estates of Baltic German landlords were taken away and the land was changed between Estonian peasants. So we were Estonians defined themselves as peasantry nation uh, in the end of First World War. Next, please. So you can see on this m map our territorial disputes uh, on the eastern border. Mm, Estonia got uh, some lands after our war of independence in 1920, according to peace agreement with Russia, and uh, those lands were taken away in uh, 1944. And in 2014, a border agreement between Estonia and Russia was um, signed, but it is not ratified yet. So for Estonians, uh, it is not a problem because uh, those are areas are mostly populated by Russians, Russian-speaking population, and uh, we feel ourselves not too connected to those are areas. But of course, in, in sense of statehood, it's always important we are, when you are losing something. Next, please. So, how our transition went during five first years. In spring uh, 1987, a so-called phosphorite or phosphate war took place. Namely, uh, the Ministry of Fertilizers of the fertilize production of uh, the Soviet Union has planned to open new phosphate mines in Northeast Estonia. It was important because uh, there was a lack of uh, products uh, 
in uh, Soviet Union during the 80s, as you remember, who remember, and, uh, and fertilizers were needed, actually. There was a big popular opposition against it because uh, it was uh, very much, it could be very much uh, hard for our nature, but also it, it could be meant that uh, several thousands of uh, workers will migrate from other parts of Soviet Union to Estonia. And uh, this was a thing what Estonians did not want because uh, during Soviet times the percentage of ethnic Estonians has sunk from 90% to 65 anyway during 40 years. So it was Estonian first experience of uh, popular movement. And then next year in 1988, new polit political parties, including Popular Front, were founded. Summer 1988 became famous for this singing revolution. Estonians gathered to our singing square and uh, demanded independence. And on a song festival on 11th of September 88, 1988, there were 300,000 participants on Singing Square in Tallinn. You have to keep in mind that the whole uh, population of Estonia in this time was one and a half million, and uh, ethnic Estonians were about less than one million, so about one third of uh, all Estonians got to this singing festival. So in, in the end of November 88, uh, Estonian Soviet Socialist uh, Republic uh, declared itself sovereign. Uh, it was a decision of our uh, Supreme Council. Then in the next year, in August uh, 1989, so-called Baltic Way from Tallinn to Vilnius with about two million participants took place. They remembered the victims of Hitler Stalin Pact, which was 50 anniversary then, and the victims of Hitler Stalin Pact were also free Baltic nations, of course, in general, because our statehood was not restored after World War II. And uh, uh, of course, Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians protested against the Soviet occupation. The distance between Tallinn and Vilnius is about 600 kilometers. In March 1990, free elections took part to the Supreme Council, and, uh, and in the Congress of uh, Estonian branch of Soviet Communist Party in, in spring 1990, Estonians left the Communist Party as they founded a separate Estonian Communist Party for a very short time, and uh, during the second half of 1990, Estonians left the Communist Party at all. So today, we have no Communist Party in Estonia. And, back, please. and uh, in next year, when, after the putsch in Moscow in August 1991, two factions in our, uh, this time Supreme Council, Popular Front and the Estonian Cong Congress uh, made an agreement to re-establish the Republic of Estonia, which was founded in 1918. It is important because Estonian Congress was an organization of, or movement of Estonian citizens. Uh, Estonian citizens were all who themselves or whose uh, direct descendants were on uh, 16th of June 1940 Estonian citizens. But Popular Front is, was like Popular Front everywhere. There were different factions. Uh, most of them supported also the idea of uh, restoring the Estonian Republic. But there was also a faction of so-called Third Republic, though they thought that uh, the Soviet period was somehow a part of Estonian statehood. And then the republic which 
what we pub uh, created in August 1991 uh, would be the third one. But uh, in, in August 1991, it was decided that uh, there, uh, the period between 1940 to 1991 was a Soviet occupation. And uh, in 1991, the Estonian Republic was restored. So in 1992, the new constitution was adopted, uh, parliamentary and presidential elec elections took place, and also currency reform. And eight Estonian crowns were equal to one German mark. And uh, this uh, currency stood until 2010 or 11, when we went to euro. Next, please. So, Estonian, the Republic of Estonia was rest restored, and uh, there were, were three things which were important. At first, legal continuity. Uh, so, uh, Western, important Western countries did not recognize the Soviet occupation of uh, Baltic states, and it was declared by un United States Under Secretary of State Sumner Wells on 23rd of July 1940. And therefore, on, on this declaration, actually, the Estonian foreign representations based in the United States, uh, Great Britain, and in some other countries, they issued Estonian passports, which were accepted as travel documents in other countries, and so on. But there was also Estonian government in exile from 1944 to 1992. Uh, this government was different from Polish exile government because uh, uh, this government uh, was not recognized by, by any other country, but of course, perhaps some other exile governments recognized it. But it was important for Estonian citizens to, who lived abroad that uh, Estonian statehood is somewhere existing. The second thing which was important was ownership reform or property of individuals who were Estonian citizens or residents on 16th of June 1940, because Soviet occupation began on the next day, get back their uh, lands, houses, and all things which were confiscated by the Soviets during the Soviet period. It was easy because, as you know, there was no private property in the Soviet Union, so also new property relationships did not emerge. And therefore, everybody get back, got back what they had. And the third point which was important was citizenship policy. Estonian citizenship was given only the, to the individuals who themselves were Estonian citizens or on 16th of June 1940 and to their children or grandchildren and others had to naturalize. For example, it was also my problem because uh, my father was born in uh, 1941, so during Soviet time. So I had to uh, prove that my grandparents were Estonian citizens. Estonian uh, legislation was quite strict at this point. Next, please. So, how we are coming to terms with our past? Uh, our strength is that uh, Estonians, at least ethnic Estonians, uh, supported and are supporting uh, strongly the restoration of the statehood. So there was nothing about communism or capitalism uh, for Estonians. Our statehood was important. We wanted to restore our nation state. And absolute majority of former communists changed very quickly to good Estonians, or some of them have always been good Estonians even. Uh, there was 100,000 members of Estonian branch of Communist Party, and um, about 50,000 of them were ethnic Estonians. Very important was the influence of the memory, famili familiar memory 
in a during and after Soviet occupation because uh, a lot of people who had grown up in uh, Estonian Republic before World War II were alive all the time and uh, their influence was very strong in the families. So it means uh, that uh, the things which were taught in the schools were not very often taken not very serious in, in respect of history, for example. Also very important was the influence of our strong exile community. In uh, 1944, about 70,000 Estonians, or 7% of Estonian population, fled to the Western countries. And uh, uh, in the end of 90s, in the beginning of, in the end of 80s, in the beginning of 90s, they imported hundreds of titles of Estonian books and particularly memoirs. Uh, which were published in exile. And uh, the beginning of the 90s, I remember, um, it was a time when people read books, yet. And of course, there are other things also. To compare the Soviet period, everything was very good during the Estonian Republic in 1980 to 1940, because it was a memory, what was told by parents or grandparents, and uh, also excuses were, were and are found, for example, for the authoritarian rule of President Konstantin Petz during uh, 1934 to 1940. But uh, there, are, there is no monument to President Petz in Estonia currently. And due to this authoritarian rule, there is a strong uh, there is a strong discussion now about should we have or should we have not the monument of Konstantin Betz. And uh, uh, people are divided between two parties in this question. And uh, there was also, there was and is an opinion that men who fought against the Soviets in 1941 to 1945 in German or Finnish uniforms fought for Estonian independence. And uh, those who were in the Red Army, because about uh, 30 or more thousand Estonians were mobilized to, red, to the Red Army too, they are today treated more or less like victims because they were not sent to the fighting troops, but they were sent to labor battalions. And there, about one quarter of them died during the first, first winter. And other than others were sent then in 42 to Estonian Rifle Corps of the Red Army. And uh, it is also important that for Estonians, history is something what is a product, product of research and, uh, and scholarly discussion. Estonians uh, do not like very much propaganda because, anyway, we've, we went through the Soviet time and therefore. We want to know how it really was. So it was problem already during the 1930s when Estonia had special institution for state propaganda, and uh, the propaganda officials uh, were not very happy about uh, it because Estonians simply did not believe what they wrote. Next, please. So. Estonian archives were opened for all users from the end of 1980s. Mm, it, was it was important because uh, to get back your lands, you needed some certificate that this land belonged to you earlier. And uh, KGB or Soviet authorities perhaps uh, were not clever enough during Soviet time to destroy their ground books. So the information was available in archives. So archives of uh, Estonian branch of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union were taken over since autumn 1991. But in other cases, uh, documents of the KGB, which remained in Estonia, they were transferred to the National Archives in uh, 1993. But the problem was that KGB was a centralized organization and uh, a lot of documents were evacuated to Soviet Union. 
already earlier. So, uh, for example, agent files and lists were taken to Russia, but tens of thousands of the files of those who applied for a travel to abroad remained in Estonia, for example. And also the files of, or personal files of individuals arrested or deported by the political reasons by the Soviets remained in Estonia or were taken back also in the beginning of 90s according to agreement between uh, Minister of Internal Affairs of Russia, Bakatin, and then our transitional uh, government. Next, please. So, we have a lot of, uh, not a lot, but uh, important laws or acts about uh, overcoming the past. All the documents are translated also into English and they are available in, in the internet, but power, PowerPoint sets certain limits. The links were too long to put here. So, in July 1992, an act of procedure for taking off of, was adopted and and it means that everybody who wanted and wants to get some uh, higher public office uh, has to swear that he had not done cooperation with uh, secret services of uh, the countries which had occupied Estonia. When Estonia was occupied by Soviets as also by the Germans and uh, Estonians cooperated the both occupying powers, so it was important to state it also about German occupation. Then in February 1995, an act with a long name, Procedure for Registration and Disclosure of Persons Who Had Served in or co Cooperated with Security Organizations or intel Intelligence or Counterintelligence Organizations of Armed Forces of States which have occupied Estonia was taken. And according to this act, everybody who has been in service of uh, some security institution or agent uh, has a time, one year, to come to internal, uh, internal security service of Estonia and confess. After that, uh, the data about their cooperation were kept in secret. Those persons uh, who did not make that their names were published in our state gazette and uh, they are today available in the internet. I think about 200 former collaborators of KGB and also some single persons who collaborated with Nazi, Ger Nazi German state security, their names were published. And uh, we had a setback in uh, September 2015 when one of uh, the persons whose name was published, a former driver, Mikhail Syro, former driver of KGB, went w with his case to European Court of Human Rights and won um, because of violation of privacy. So Estonian state has to pay some fee to him. So and in December 2003, uh, persons rep repressed by o Occupying powers, powers Act was adopted and, uh, and this act uh, uh, sets clear who are repressed person and who are not and also there are long chapters about social guarantees for people. You can see it in internet. And, uh, one thing more, Estonia has sentenced uh, 10 and more people who participated in deportations or were also killing agents during the uh, 1940s, 1950s. And some cases reached also European Court of Human Rights and European Court of Human Rights uh, has uh, recognized the decisions of Estonian courts. So we have the full court procedure in some cases about people who participated in deportations in, for example, 1949. Next, please. So 
here is uh, some paragraphs from this uh, uh, Repressed Persons Act. My time is over, so I will not go into detail, but uh, look to the right column. Uh, from the repressed persons were accepted people who were members of the lower level service personnel or, or support staff or persons who joined the Communist Bolshevik Party of the Soviet Union before 1st of January 1954. Why is this date? Because, you know, Stalin died in, uh, in March 1953 and some people who were deported to the Siberia, uh, like children. Among them were a lot of people who joined the Communist Party in their adult adulthood. But before, this, before during Stalin's that time, uh, to be a member of uh, Communist Party, it means something different. You had to want to be a member of Communist Party. In the 70s, uh, 80s, it was sometimes simply a compromise for something. Not good, but anyway. Next, please. So some, some examples of uh, overcoming the past in practice. In 2000, elected president of the Bank of Estonia resigned two days before the beginning of his term. Allegedly, he could not take the off due to the Soviet time KGB contacts. The problem was that uh, the thing is, of course, uh, covered by our uh, internal security service, but uh, it, seems, it seemed that he has confessed his contacts and uh, thought, therefore, that he can to be in high public office, but he cannot. The next, in autumn 2005, Minister of Defense resigned because his subordinate, the director of the War Museum, wore the T-shirt with the slogan, Commies into the oven, or Communists into the oven. You know, it is a paraphrase of uh, quite a common anti-Semitic uh, slogan, and it has long story in Estonia, but anyway, on this T-shirt was also the name of this Minister of Defense himself, because he was also a member of the Communist Party. Actually, he was a diplomat later and writer and more or less good, good guy, but uh, like protesting this behavior of his subordinate, he resigned as Minister of Defense. Both were candidates for presidency in this year in Estonian presidential elections small country. So in 2013, a person withdrew his candidature at the election of Tartu City Council. Tartu is our university city. He was a mayor candid mayor's candidate of the right radicals. But it was disclosed that he had, during Soviet times, KGB contacts. He was a... Mm, uh, assistant professor of philosophy at the university and perhaps he is also today in the same position. And in February this year, former long-time editor-in-chief of the Estonian biggest daily refused the title of honorary citizens of the city of Tartu, the same Tartu, our university city, because of accusations against him for writing in the 1980s articles in which he taunted the dissidents. And it was true, and we remember the articles, everybody knew it, but uh, some people, some his supporters, uh, thought that it is, it is not a case anymore, but it was a case in this year. Next, please. So, mm, uh, the, and the last slide, our latest declarations in Estonia. In February 2012, the parliament made a statement paying tribute to the Estonian citizens. The problem was behind this uh, statement that for a long time the, uh, mem the men who fought in German uniform 
uh, during F World War, War II, they wanted that they were recognized as freedom fighters. For, an, for foreign policy of a member state of European Union in 2012, such a decision would be a, more or less like suicide. So the issue was discussed along, and the, in the end, a statement was made according to which uh, everybody was uh, paid tribute who acted in the name of de facto restoration of the Republic of Estonia. So the idea was hidden during, under such wording. And as you know, perhaps we have a new government now since October, November. And in, in the government program or basic principles of the government coalitions for 2016 to 2019, there is an article also about uh, communist past. We will maintain awareness of the crimes of totalitarian regimes by establishing an international center of the crimes of communism in Tallinn and a memorial complex to the victims of the communism. So, thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. The main partner of uh, uh, the institutions of national memory here in Ukraine is, of course, uh, uh, Ukrainian Institute of National Remembrance. Uh, I believe that uh, the Institute uh, will uh, play the leading role uh, in, in the process uh, of preserving national memory after, uh, the, the, after the transformation of archive system by the law. Uh, Igor Kulik is uh, head of department of, of the Institute. Please. Доброго дня, колеги. Власне, я спробую коротко проговорити в слів. I will try to uh, cover very briefly two, uh, two issues. The first issue, what was also already mentioned, um, it is what happens uh, within Ukraine and uh, abroad what our colleagues from Estonia have already mentioned, concerns the opening of uh, KGB archives. Very briefly, why it, is, why it has happened and what the results we have. Uh, this is one of the positive um, issues uh, we have in terms of decommunization, uh, which Ukraine can present to different um, other countries. Um, moreover, I will talk about illustration, about uh, how important this uh, moment is. I will mention that it is one of the key issues uh, of, com uh, of uh, combating the um, effects of the totalitarian past and how it will work in Ukraine. So, if we are talking about the access to KGB archives, it has been already mentioned that since May last year in Ukraine, there are four decommunization laws in Ukraine, which were developed by the uh, Ukrainian Institute of National Remembrance, and this institute, and the way of um, passing these laws was fast, but the development stage, the elaboration stage, in, within different focus groups was quite long. If we are talking about laws, laws on uh, the access to KGB, KGB archives, this question was discussed since uh, 2008. When we are talking about the access to KGB archives, we should mention that this law takes into account the experience we had at that time. It is the experience of Czech Republic, of Poland, because uh, it is their legislature taking into account the massive documents these uh, countries have are rather liberal, and the principle which is... Ba uh, 
The basic principle in Ukrainian law is that everything is open for everybody. It was taken from the documents of legislation of the countries which I have just mentioned, countries of Central and Eastern Europe. When we are talking about KGBM documents, we should understand that we have several institutions in Ukraine uh, which uh, still keep uh, the documents which refer not only to KGB because KGB is just one um, repressive body, but in general to all those structures that uh, uh, that were put into the basis of uh, uh, Soviet totalitarian system. Uh, these are, if we briefly um, mention them, are the archives of security service of Ukraine. Moreover, we have archi archives of foreign intelligence agency, uh, of police. Uh, the data in these archives are just uh, very enormous. We are talking about penitentiary, courts, uh, Ministry of Defense. These are um, archives which, uh, which are located in every region of Ukraine. So who can and has the right to work uh, with these documents? Uh, everybody. As I have already mentioned, uh, everything is open for everybody, and it means that uh, uh, both citizens of Ukraine, foreigners, stateless people, have a right to uh, uh, to ask uh, um, to take some documents and uh, uh, search some uh, information connected with a particular um, historical episode or uh, or his personality whether we are talking about family relations or historical events. So everybody who works in archives with these documents, everybody has uh, free, uh, freedom to come to uh, the reading hall, um, get the original documents, work with them, and do everything they want, uh, and even uh, take uh, photos uh, for free. Uh, these are uh, the uh, in uh, European approach. Uh, we don't mention uh, the term document anymore. Uh, the key question is about information and the access to the information. Mm, and the term uh, information is the most important in this act. Uh, the second uh, main thing is that uh, in this uh, act, uh, uh, it, this act has um, the possibility uh, not uh, so the archives uh, staff personnel uh, is not uh, responsible for the information. They just have to give this document and then the user has the full uh, accountability to uh, to use this information, maybe even to publish on the internet, popu uh, popularize and uh, to, to make this information free. And uh, he, however, he has to realize what information he has uh, he has to popularize. Uh, the most uh, popular thing in uh, Europe is um, the uh, uh, is the principle that the document uh, who has uh, the grief uh, uh, secrecy. Um, or the marks of the Soviet uh, regime, uh, and uh, the uh, classified document is not a uh, secret document. That is why we have to um, work with this document for free and free of charge. 
and it doesn't depend whether we ha we speak about the uh, staff uh, personnel or freelance personnel or about those uh, secret agents. That is why uh, all of these documents are free and free of charge. And uh, the most full list of uh, bonds and uh, files or minimal information uh, can be found on the internet. Uh, they are on the website of the State uh, Archive Service of Ukraine. And um, we can find the information about the state and regional archives uh, and where we, you can find any information f for free and free of charge. And you can photograph this information and popularize anywhere. However, if we speak about other archives, uh, about and uh, mm, uh, other archives don't uh, uh, don't have such uh, uh, detailized information because uh, they uh, they were elaborated not just to uh, they were done in order to compromise those to, uh, those people who were living during the Soviet regime. So not to unleash those people and to influence uh, on the society and to m make society more uh, loyal. And so this is the very moment that has uh, its own um, peculiarities. So concerning the uh, illustration, uh, this is uh, one more way to influence society. And uh, this concerns uh, the people who are uh, in power or was in power. And the uh, in illustration is in Ukrainian dimension is something different from the European uh, illustration. For example, um, if a Western country's illustration is something like uh, uh, decommunization, uh, and in our country illustration has some wider um, understanding, and in our society it um, uh, means that illustration equals with the uh, fight uh, with corruption, because uh, those uh, act uh, on uh, uh, on the uh, pun purification of power. Um, in this act, uh, it is said that uh, uh, we have to fight with uh, those civil servants who were in power during the Yanukovych period and uh, during the um, Maidan revolution. And the last... Um, and and this, and this uh, uh, law contains um, the uh, rule not to uh, put in power uh, people who has some uh, connections with uh, s special services. So there are three uh, grounds. Uh, uh, the first ones are uh, regular employees. Uh, the second point is uh, agents uh, who were working um, in KGB USSR or in KGB Ukrainian SSR or any other s special services who uh, were connected um, uh, with collaboration. And the third principle is uh, are those people who graduated from the higher, uh, from the institutions of higher education, um, and they were um, educated by those methods that were employed during the Soviet regimes. Let's uh, detailize uh, some uh, particular principles, because uh, And the uh, illustration, uh, the only or, uh, body uh, who uh, make the illustration uh, law is the uh, uh, service of Ukraine. So 
uh, they uh, don't contain not only in the uh, archive of uh, um, it also includes uh, the offices of uh, external intelligence with their own uh, field archives but again during the Soviet period it was one of the branches of KGB and of course it's police which several times during the Soviet Union uh, united it was like a popular committee it's one peculiarity that is why now we will talk about what of I would like to point out every of these three issues, uh, how whether it is full or not full. When we are talking about uh, regular employees, we are talking about uh, personal cases uh, of um, employees and um, card indexes for them. When we are talking about educational institutions, we uh, mean uh, foundation of all Ukrainian schools of uh, NKVD SS SSR in Kyiv. What is uh, pe peculiar about these uh, aspects? If we take them, we can uh, detect whether this person really was a regular employee or graduated from some uh, KGB educational establishment. Uh, and mm, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't limit on, it is not limited uh, only on Ukrainian territory. If uh, the person served uh, uh, abroad, uh, then uh, we do not have any data in our Ukrainian archives. An issue which rea really interests uh, other people, it is secret agents. Here the situation is completely different. Uh, now we have about uh, 800 uh, personal records of secret agents and the rest information is available but it is scattered, it is divided in different cases and, uh, and uh, it is not, uh, not full. Uh, for instance, there can be uh, not uh, not a real name, and in some other document there can be his real name. Mm. So why do we have so little data? Uh, that's, let's return to what our Estonian colleagues told, taking into account that uh, Ukraine was trusted more in Moscow. Uh, despite we have uh, many documents, we still have um, a law which was issued uh, in 90th, in 90th years uh, which allowed which allowed our authority to destroy um, a lot of documents so when everybody when the authority understood that the situation is changing that they were facing real changes they destroyed um, uh, they destroyed uh, l uh, the late documents, uh, that, that is documents of 60s, 70s years, and the documents, uh, of course, uh, the most documents were uh, c concerned special secret agents. Um, of course, not everything was destroyed, but uh, the most, uh, a big part of them, of the documents was destroyed. Uh, it also concerns uh, uh, 39, uh, 40 years. Maybe we cannot trust uh, this information, uh, but uh, uh, there were uh, 150,000 agents um, took into the Red Army in uh, Western Ukraine. So what problems do we have with the illustration law? The developers of law didn't uh, make any accent on, on the illustration in European understanding. Uh, we didn't take into account uh, uh, this 
European vision, it wasn't the most important for them. It, uh, the most important was to combat corruption, to um, fight the people which were at the uh, high positions during Yanukovych uh, authority. And uh, the problem is that information is scattered in different archives and it is not systematized. It is not, it is uncategorized uncatalogued. So it should be uh, searched and it should be uh, worked on further. So for, uh, for me, I think that uh, there is a very restricted term of check. It is only one month. Uh, but uh, we have to check 1,000 uh, one million officials. So uh, when uh, we receive uh, hundreds of uh, um, applications during one day, it is physically impossible. And uh, as for the experience of the uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, a person can mention only if uh, can a person only mentions whether the law applies to him or her or not. So uh, a person must not inform um, what was his or her position, what were his or her tasks. Uh, he, can, he or she can only mention whether he referred to uh, Soviet um, organization or not. So we have a uh, completely different vision of this issue. Another interesting um, issue is uh, a case which lasted for even uh, a year. Mm. Well, the law could be, uh, could be understood word by word. Uh, the laws, uh, for instance, the law stated that illustration concerns uh, employees, people who were who worked in the KGB, understood that uh, employees were civil people, people who occupied very uh, low positions like printers, some technical personnel, people who were just starting their career in KGB. But of course, all people who had influence, who took decisions, who could influence the functionality of the whole system and the whole, the whole society, society um, they were on a higher level in KGB. They were military officials. So this discussion between different bodies lasted for one year, whether military officials uh, should be illustrated or not. Uh, so when the year passed, this discussion uh, was ended and uh, KGB officials uh, uh, were decided to be illustrated. So as a result, there was one more problem which uh, you, Central and Eastern Europe also tried to solve. But now we have this problem in our country. So it, when we have documents about illustration, uh, when we have some data about uh, supposedly um, collaboration with KGB, it is one of the elements uh, of, of reasons to like, to change the date of uh, illustration. So there should be, uh, we should establish a civil body. Uh, there should be a um, united civil body that can unite all scattered documents and work with them, uh, put them into catalogs, systematize them, uh, put them in, into internet, um, reveal the access to them. Uh, and uh, th thus we, we could get rid of this uh, Soviet influence and uh, avoid these political discussions. 
And that is why uh, such uh, institution uh, in, uh, stated in the law about uh, opened archives, uh, it is creation of the archive, archive of uh, uh, in national memory, uh, which should uh, include uh, all documents from different archives. Uh, when we are talking about this uh, 10,000 of uh, these uh, cases, in our Soviet uh, past, in our Soviet dimension, it means that all these 150 kilometers of cases is even more than we have in Czech Republic, in Poland, in Germany, because there there are only 100 or 50 kilometers. We have 150 kilometers. Besides the peculiarity of our documents is that we were um, a country of Soviet Union. We had more trust from Moscow. Our documents were more valuable, more direct than those of uh, other social countries. So uh, that is why we have enormous uh, quantity of documents in Ukraine. And we have to open these archi archives to disclose them. Uh, because earlier, uh, for about 100, 100 years, some case may be closed, and now we have an opportunity uh, to continue its investigation, to continue uh, to find out how could be functioned, what uh, Soviet Union in reality was, and uh, research uh, polit its political structure and the anatomy of uh, the totalitarian regime, so to say, on the basis of uh, documents of the 20th century. So this is why I invite you to our archives, first of all to the archives of Security Service of Ukraine, in order to help uh, the archive to conduct illustration, to understand uh, its history, to make it not only one of the elements uh, of school of school program, but make the history which would be interesting, demanding, and necessary for uh, adult people. Thank you. So thank you. I'm looking forward to becoming uh, a scholar. Uh, I mean, a researcher in your uh, in your new archive. Uh, very important role, maybe uh, main role in uh, uh, memory, uh, national memory institutions place uh, Polish Institute of uh, Polish Institute. Uh, національної пам'яті. Тож містер Добровський зараз є в якості експерта у нас в залі. Дякую вам. Ми маємо дещо пришвидшитися. Я вирішив дещо скоротити мою промову. Я, мені сказали сказати декілька слів щодо національної пам'яті в стабілізації і об'єднанні і в перехідних суспільствах, і особливо, що стосується розкриття секретних архівів, що стосується владних режимів та розслідування злочинів старого порядку. Я хотів би коротко розповісти про риси полі... польського досвіду в цій галузі, але, звичайно, не про, ве... не про весь, оскільки цей період охоплює 27 років. Тому я розкажу, розкажу про певні моменти. Декілька ремарків. Ми 
In the Polish in experiences, the most important part of the national feeling were intrinsically connected with the abovement communities. It is generally recognized now that the state bears the responsibility for supporting these communities as vehicles of national and social values. The results of the communist intrusion into national culture, into mutual trust, the basic thread of a society, and of misinterpretations of Polish history and national interests are still visible. The most important tool to deal with these negative outcomes uh, is principled education based on truth and value-oriented point of view. State education, although flawed, becomes then an important factor in formation of society. Unfortunately, in the last years, the popular education system in Poland was reshaped, uh, leaving the natural sciences and history teaching behind. It should be noted that those reformations met significant protests against the downgrading of history teaching. Some lost elements of uh, history teaching were balanced by very strong publicity of some uh, recent events. Uh, it should be noted that one of those there were so-called recent exhumations of hidden bodies of communist crimes victims. Above mentioned exhumations revealed the brutality and inhumanity of the communist rule and cause public outrage, shock. Uh, it became clear that almost every security station, uh, police station, uh, had similar secret cache of bodies and the whole country had many hidden cemeteries. This led to a very publicity effect. So, we can say that uh, there's a distinct social interest in dealing with the past. Uh, my own institution, Institute for National Remembrance, uh, has a significant record of more than a decade of extensive uh, educational activities. Uh, we have printed a series of scientific studies, but also popular books, even comics and games. We had uh, managed to uh, write, uh, I can say, very, very good handbook of recent history. Uh, it's also published online, so it's uh, in a free access. We have organized uh, a series of educational activities in schools and with societies, also exhibitions. Uh, however, our, our Bureau for National Education uh, is not in position to uh, replace the public uh, education system. Um, we can say that the outcomes of our activities seem to be promising. Um, we can also no note that some parts of the, this buried history, uh, especially the fates of a Polish armed resistance against communist rule after the Second World War, found their way into the pop culture. Ah, uh, was connected to the opening of a secret archives. Well, again, as an introduction, I, I might say that uh, right to the past is not only a personal, human or citizen's individual entitlement, but also a community right. Uh, of course, some kind of a tension between the individual and the community interests is still visible, uh, still exists. But the scope and the character of damages suffered by nations under the communist dictatorships made the community interest prior to any other. Uh, a part of a of a Czech, German, and Polish regulations concerning the dealing with the former dictatorship's archives, there is an international guideline prepared for UNESCO on behalf of the International Council of Archives. It's known as Quintana Report. It was published in 1995. Uh, it is also updated in uh, 2009. Uh, 
this report may be seen as a guideline for, for every nation affected by dictatorship. Uh, this report categorizes and lists a number of rights belonging to the community and individuals concerning the access and the use of archives of security services and ruling parties or other organizations of repressive regimes. The so-called collective rights, according to the report, are right to the memory, right to the truth, right to justice, right to know those who are responsible for crimes against human rights. As individual rights, this report uh, explains right to exoneration and rehabilitation, right to know the whereabouts of the family members who, in quotation marks, disappeared in a time of repression, right of everyone to know what information is held on them in the archives of repression. Right to historical and scientific research. And the, uh, the amnesty for the political prisoners. Freedom of conscience. Right to compensation and redress for damages. redress for damages suffered by victims of the repression, right to have confiscated goods restored. So the archival uh, resources for Communist Party, its subordinate organization and proxies, leading government bodies, judicial bodies, and especially security services should be open for the public. Polish experiences in this field seem to be a timeline of progress. Progress made under the stress, the pressure of public demand. And this progress were, was blocked by some post-communist governments and several influent political circles. Uh, Polish Communist Party records were transferred um, soon after dismantling of this party uh, together with resources of some other main repressive institutions of dictatorship. The censorship office, the so-called special commission for fight against the profiteering the Office for the Church Affairs, and some others. So those records were transferred to the main historical archive in Warsaw, Archivum Aknowy. Uh, and um, uh, when it comes to the party records, uh, those, those archives remained closed for the substantial amount of time, apparently because of so-called ordering of the fund reasons. The access to these files was granted to few researchers with a district, district uh, detriment for public interest. The access to the records of former communist security services was even more closed. Few researchers were granted access to little amount of files. They were not allowed to see any finding aid or registry. The access to the files of military security Police and military intelligence were almost completely closed. <coughs> the law regulated access to the files was not granted to the citizens affected. The situation changed after the forming of the Institute of National Remembrance in 1998. But it, 
in a matter of fact, it, not, it wasn't a speedy change. The real moment of forming of the Institute was year 2001, more than 10 years after the fall of our communist rule. It was also a beginning of uh, acquisition of the archival resources, its declassifying, description, and opening to the wider access. The initial act forming the IPN, um, IPN Channel Charter, followed the German example. Uh, it means B BSTU, uh, Gaugbehörde. During almost 18 years after its passing, the act, the act had changed, uh, was changed a lot of times. Uh, but the succeeding adjustments were resulting in further liberalization of access to the files. So we uh, came from the strict German model uh, to the very liberal model. I, may, I can say that we followed uh, from the German specimen to the Czech uh, specimen. Now, every citizen is entitled to have insight in the files and other entries concerning him or her or his late uh, relatives. Everyone is entitled to have insight into the records of the public persons. And the Institute publishes the information on such people on its website. The archive finding aid is also published uh, in a form of an uh, internet search engine with some restrictions, but uh, it mirrors our um, uh, find, finding aid. The access to the files for the press and researchers is guaranteed and widely used. One of the main impediments of access to the archive was and partially still is its secret status. As the legitimacy of the regime's laws was not generally denied, the security classifications marking the files and records were not abolished. The subsequent changes in the laws concerning official secrets uh, emailed, uh, enable uh, us to declare those markings void. But that the classification proceedings are still demanded by law. So now it's rather administrative problem than, than uh, other. Uh, the other ser serious impediment in access to the files that attracts huge publicity is a permission granted to the security services to levy the restriction on some files and resources due to the grave reasons of the state security. This permission led to the forming of the so-called restricted resource or restricted fund that contained also a main operative card indexes. Its contents were supposed to stay secret with a possibility of review. And this subsequent review of, the, of this restricted fund, of this restricted resource, revealed that uh, the restrictions were imposed on the files and data which release would not threaten the state's security. The restrictions led to some legal uh, cul-de-sac. <laughs> uh, main operative indexes and registry logs were kept conditionally secret there was no possibility to, to use them as a base for the open finding aid. The use of these instruments were extensive, but needed fully secrecy proceedings, ending in the classification, of course. Restrictions created even a classical catch-22 case. Some electronic data carriers were initially unreadable, 
so they might contain the restricted entries. So they became restricted. And there was no possibility to declassify and read them because they were restricted. So this restricted resource is now a found of about 400 kern meters volume. Initially, it, had, it was far more. But the constant review made the numbers sink. The key decisions that allowed to declassify the files from this resource, especially concerning the foreign intelligence files and military service files, were made in the uh, year 2006 and from the year 2011. Well, the last amendment of the, of the IPN charter, uh, charter abolished the existence of this restricted resource at all, leaving to secret services only few entitlements to sustain the classifying marks on files, on few files. The deadline of the release uh, is 31st March of uh, 2017. So the deadline is closed. Ah, according to the dealings with communist officials and investigating the communist crimes, we may say that the result of the settlement of the communist rule in Poland is um, uh, far from uh, far from good. It's rather disappointing. There's a visible tension between public expectations towards prosecution of communist crimes and the complexity of judiciary proceedings and changing policies. The members of a Communist Party and its satellite organizations were never prevented of taking part in public life in Poland after 1980-89, of course. The project, the first project of the Communization Act submitted to Parliament in 1991 was proceeded till dissolution of the Chamber in 1993 without being, being voted. The next parliament, with the majority of uh, communist or post-communist parties, did not even try to take this project into consideration. Uh, similar project of 1997 did not succeed either. The ruling post-solidarity coalition was deeply divided on various points, and this bill, restricting citizen rights, was also not taken into consideration. The attempts to summarily deprive the former members of security services and other repressive formations uh, of part of their citizen rights were connected with uh, above mentioned project of settlement of uh, Communist Party member status and were buried with these above mentioned projects. There was a special resolution of Parliament declaring that Communist Party is a criminal organization, but it did not contain any executive section and did not lead to any general consequences either. Well, uh, the middle versions of the communization, uh, that means lustration uh, and pensions equality, uh, were also the opposed and discussed in a series of heated debates within post-solidarity movements, and summarily rejected by post-communists. The first attempt of lustration understood as revealing of the information about, about public personalities from the resources of the former communist security service. Uh, it was the review of files and records of former security service concerning the members of parliament and government personalities, and it was conducted in the uh, spring of 1992. It was called Macierewicz's list, Lista Macierewicza. Uh, 
limited revealing of this Macierewicz list, who was then Minister of Internal Affairs in charge of uh, security service records, uh, delivered to the members of parliament as classified document, it caused lightning reaction of then President Lech Wałęsa. Uh, he was obviously personally interested in this matter, uh, as it appeared later. Uh, he was uh, supposedly an uh, informant of a security service. So the reaction of uh, Wałęsa and parliamentary coalition of fear uh, was imminent, and the government fell in the next 24 hours. A few weeks later, the Constitutional Court found a parliamentary act that caused this uh, all turmoil unconstitutional. The illustration theme was not only uh, was not officially raised till 1997, when the landslide victory of post illustration of post solidarity coalition ended the post communist rule. Uh, meanwhile, it became clear that although burying former communists from holding public offices, from holding public posts, would be seen as a not very sophisticated political vendetta, the former informants and functionaries of security service dwelling in the highest levels of political life may undermine or compromise virtually every undertaking. Polish illustration law arranged, was arranged as a judiciary process of vetting the candidates to public offices, uh, was formed not in order to publish or summarily exclude former secret collaborators, secret informants of communist security service, but to enhance the transparency of a public life, uh, to eliminate the possibility of blackmail from within or from abroad, and to avoid promotion of people with hidden connections. The only punishment foreseen for the deceitful illustration statements was ban of taking the public posts. The illustration proceedings were to be prepared by a new independent agency, uh, Biuro Rzecznika Interesu Publicznego, Bureau for the Public Interest Advocate. In uh, 2007, it was incorporated into Institute of N National Remembrance. Uh, soon emerged some institu institutional obstacles to the activities of uh, so-called RIP. Uh, the relevant court unit, so-called illustration chamber, could not be formed because of the reluctance of the judges. There were few candidates to join the new court chamber, and those willing were not nominated by judges' assemblies. Crisis was overcome with the amendments to the Illustration Act that changed the procedure of forming the Illustration Chamber. The next years of functioning of the illustration proceedings were marked by obstruction performed by the, the then holders of the security services records. Uh, it means uh, military and civil secret services and reluctance of courts to recognize the former secret police uh, informants as such. <laughs> The first major blow came from the highest court of Republic, which announced that uh, judiciary terms of secret collaboration uh, do not recognize the historical conditions of collaboration and set the terms of illustration almost impossible to be met in many apparently obvious cases. The illustration law was on the way to become the impunity screen for many. There were cases, uh, for example, of Marian Jurczyk, declared not affected uh, despite the undisputable evidence, even uh, due to these judicial terms. Maciej Kozłowski, declared not affected, as acting in permissible error of judgment uh, when his subsequent deceitful statements were not verified. Finally, Lech Wałęsa declared not affected in apparently flawed uh, proceeding. Inter alia uh, 
agency holding the, the records and information withheld part of the information before the court. <laughs> Years later, it became also known that security services have hidden relevant information on the vetted people in this restricted resource, restricted fund of, uh, in the archive of IPN. So, um, the changes of the Illustration Act decentralized the proceedings and then significantly increased the number of post, posts to be vetted. Well. In the same time, the wider access to the files uh, was granted and it created the informal competition. The illustrated individuals could not hope to hide behind a secrecy screen. And uh, just because they, the, the information that was taken to the court was also available for press and researchers. Uh, now we can see the slow but supposedly not revertible process of progress of the judiciary evaluations of the illustration statements and uh, relevant evidence. Uh, according to the, to the other thing, the investigating communist crimes, we can say that the prosecution of the communist crimes should be estimated in Poland as unsatisfactory. Only a handful of the most serious criminals were tried and successfully sentenced. Only few of uh, main political personalities involved in proclamation of martial law in 1981 were sentenced. They received suspended sentences. So nobody uh, went to jail. Communist dictator, Wojciech Jaruzelski and his right-hand man, Czesław Kiszczak, for a long time avoided the court as unfit to trial and did not spend any day in custody. The investigation in the case of abduction and murder of Reverend Jerzy Popiełuszko failed as prosecution was unable to find evidence against the supervisors of murderers. The murders themselves were not to be tried due to the principle non bis in idem. It means double jail party. Although the first trial was apparently staged. The case of disciplinary hearings of judges sentencing against the principle lex retro non agit during the martial law seems to be particularly appealing. Uh, according to the highest court ruling, the communist Poland was not a state of the rule of law. So the judges acting against one of the basic principles of law are not to be disciplined as they were not obliged to act lawfully in the period affected. Verdict has been written, written into the so-called book of the judiciary principles of the highest court. There's another verdict concerning the illustration proceedings uh, towards, towards judges. Uh, it says that illustration proceedings threatens the principle of judicial independence and should be preceded by mandatory disciplinary hearing, allowing or not the vetting itself. So, of course, it was just a little review of uh, uh, highlights uh, of negative specimens. Of course, the system is working. And we may say that the system is working in accordance with uh, publicity. The number of the illustration cases ending with a uh, ban for taking public posts is really high and uh, due to the uh, shape of the law it s shows that the infiltration of society by secret service was very wide. So it makes 
the standard of the public living, of the public life. Uh, I, and we can say that despite these unsatisfactory highlights, we can say that outcome supposedly will be positive. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, speaker will be uh, Olena Halimon, uh, consultant of Ukraine Institute of National Labor Rights. Please. Thank you. Прошу презентацію. Як сказали вже попередні спікери, людство різноманітне і розвивається аритмічно. It develops dynamically. And the same happens in Ukraine. A part of Ukrainian population is still in some uh, past uh, generation and doesn't want to get used to new circumstances and doesn't want to um, solve problems. Another part wants to, um, uh, to catch up with time and wants progress and development. How shall we uh, raise the awareness of Ukrainian society? Um, that is our task. That is what we are talk what we are doing in the Ukrainian Institute in national of national remembrance. We have 35 people. Me and my colleagues work on uh, informational projects, and I would like to uh, point out exactly them. As you know, the Ukrainian Institute of uh, National Remembrance is a central uh, body of uh, national government. Our mission is uh, the formation of uh, societal immunity against the uh, breach of uh, uh, human rights. Our aim, maybe uh, we have uh, many uh, common views with our colleagues. We are working on uh, keeping and rest uh, restoration of uh, um, of the memory of uh, people's memory, uh, combating of uh, effects of totalitarian past, of on changing uh, of uh, societal on uh, societal t uh, and on restoration of uh, justice concerning political repressions uh, and, and criminals in uh, criminal actions in Ukraine in 1917-1991. Uh, our main tasks uh, include five of them. It is the communization, which has already been mentioned. My colleagues also t uh, told about the access to uh, KGB archives. We are also working on keeping of uh, um, monuments of memory and uh, educational projects. As for the communization, I don't know whether we should stop on it, because a lot has been said. It has been said that we have to combat uh, the effects of the influence of communist ideology. Uh, this photo shows uh, Kiev Lenin, which died three years ago. It was uh, the revolution of, of uh, Gidniti. And I remember that moment when I wrote about this moment in social networks and caused uh, um, a large, uh, so to say, storm, because uh, my colleagues even asked me, why have you done this? Uh, I personally didn't take part in it, but I, uh, we were um, accused uh, of uh, this act. Uh, earlier, people told that uh, there is a conflict of uh, uh, generations. Um, I I was addressed by people of uh, younger generation, which uh, who didn't understood uh, why we need uh, the communication process uh, as it is, and why should we fight uh, totalitarian regimes and uh, the symbols. As for the access of archives, uh, Igor has told about it. I will not stop on this uh, question. I will outline other projects. Uh, Ukrainian Institute of National Remembrance uh, considers uh, a very important issue uh, of 9-8 May. It is a project 
When we are talking about Second World War, red poppy should be its symbol. And we are trying to explain why it should be its symbol, why we should talk not about the 8th uh, or 9th May, because it is European world tradition to commemorate the victims of war. Moreover, our uh, task, uh, the object of memory is uh, individuality, but not masses and leaders. Also, we speak about that uh, we uh, that we uh, restoration of the history and the conquering of the totalitarian regime. And uh, if to speak about details, uh, um, it is very often that uh, Ukrainian uh, Un Institute of uh, National Memory um, makes make different exhib exhibitions. In the center of this exhibition is Ukraine and the role of Ukrainians in the World War. The most uh, important is that um, uh, the contribution of Ukrainian nation uh, over the conquering of nazism. There are we have also another project. Uh, we speak about the, the Ukrainians um, who conquered uh, uh, in uh, Red Army National, uh, in uh, Polish, French, uh, British, and Canadian armed forces. We also. Um, decided uh, where we have to demonstrate these projects and we ask them uh, for the wide range of uh, popularization except this we uh, we publish uh, books and brochures and this is the most important theme uh, uh, we have very interesting pr project uh, War and Myth, uh, the uh, unrevealed uh, site of the Second World War. Uh, 50, 15 authors worked uh, over 50 uh, plots. Y you can uh, buy this book in our uh, institute. Also, our um, colleagues uh, created a website, uh, Ukrainian Second World War. It is very interactive and mobile. You can find there very many interesting um, uh, moments. Uh, you can find there videos, exhibitions, uh, uh, maps, uh, and many, many others. Uh, you may see the uh, address of this website on the screen. And you can uh, go there and just uh, uh, to find something interesting for you. Um, my colleague spoke about that uh, popularization moments. And uh, one more project uh, is of ours is the historical calendars. We speak about those uh, ceremonial um, datas and those uh, places who were in the past. Had n however, they now have to be remembered so that they are uh, just commemorating these um, space, these dates and these um, places. Um, we also uh, develop our um, methodical guidelines for uh, universities, uh, schools and army. It is very important to uh, teach, uh, to l learn history. And I agree with this, uh, is the very important nu nuance. And according to this, uh, it is uh, much more e much, much easier to speak with people who know who know history. Uh, we also uh, develop a project of um, uh, of uh, which is called the history of Ukrainian army. Uh, we um, s uh, we tell there that uh, it um, it was from the 11th century until the uh, nowadays uh, we have another exhibition project uh, here we speak about uh, it 
um, it is called the uh, people of independence, the 25 uh, personalities who embellish uh, the um, who are the symbols of independence uh, of uh, and, uh, and creativity. One more project we worked on is Baban Yar. Uh, it uh, locates on the territory of Baban Yar. It speaks about all people who were uh, who were the victims of Baban Yar. We think that uh, it is the first uh, step. Um, in front of uh, conquering of memories uh, on the territory of tragedy. One more drama pages of uh, our history is Holodomor uh, genocide during 1932-1933. Um, previous year we made exhibition uh, one more um, exhibition concerning Holodomor and we speak about this strategy. This year we have another accent uh, that we are unconquered. We spoke about uh, 15 uh, people uh, who um, outlived the Holodomor and how they, um, how Holodomor uh, uh, those times reflects on their lives. Uh, for example, Katarina Bilokur was an artist Um, the our institute uh, also uh, work on the restoration and uh, of of the uh, places of memory. It is called the Museum of Maidan, and it uh, in this museum uh, we collect the artifacts from Maidan, and we uh, record the uh, evidences of. Um, of the participants of this uh, of uh, these events, so there are kind of uh, ar archive Maidan archive, and uh, we also have um, made uh, the space of Maidan some kind of exhibition, so that uh, they were memorized, they will be memorized. So we have also the archive of oral history. We um, uh, recorded uh, videos and audio, audios uh, um, of the participants of the uh, revolution of uh, dignity. We published many books. For example, Maidan uh, from the first uh, person, and for example, the oral history of Russian and Ukrainian war. Uh, we have one more project, uh, the Museum of Monumental Propaganda. It is the work uh, title. Uh, maybe you know the. Um, so uh, the principle is uh, to gather together all the uh, propagandas during the communist regime. So uh, the aim is to preserve the all the objects, uh, places uh, that has artistic. Uh, value uh, and we um, uh, work according to the uh, practice European practice one more our project is uh, the national Path pantheon or memorial uh, where the national heroes must be buried, and, and as well as the uh, national um, personalities. Uh, this is our future project. The the idea is uh, that this um, it must be the place of uh, uh, ceremonial uh, ceremonies, and also uh, the burial um, place of national heroes. So one more uh, project is the Ukrainian and Polish Forum of Historians, where there are the specialists from Ukraine and Poland, and they discuss the uh, um, main questions concerning the Ukrainian and Polish history. The aim is uh, to contact, to collaborate with Polish uh, scientists 
scientists and uh, to discuss the most important and um, questions. So th this uh, this is the main information. Thank you. Running, unfortunately, uh, I have to uh, close uh, our conference. Uh, thank you for the. You know, I understand we have uh, five or four more minutes uh, before we have to uh, leave uh, uh, the place. You know, so that's 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 the point. Jiří, jak to, jak to, jak to? Okay, so we have five, five minutes for, for, uh, for questions, please. But we don't hear anything because she doesn't switch a microphone. Please switch on the microphone. Yes. Okay. Thank you, thank you. So we have heard about uh, national, uh, some puzzle of uh, national memory. We have heard from Estonian, Estonian uh, guests that they do not have official history and that it is created in the process of education and research. I think that in Ukraine, uh, the concept of national memory contradicts uh, contradict, contradicts uh, this official history, which also is lacking in uh, Estonia. So, do you hear what, do you Ukrainian colleagues hear what Estonian colleagues tell you? So, the second question is, don't you feel that, one moment, that uh, Ukrainian researchers, in particular the institution of national remembrance, that instead of inst institutionalization of history, we create its uh, instrumentalization. It is like a kind of uh, um, um, institutional body which creates uh, a common Ukrainian, but at the same time propagandic history. Uh, the third question is that do you feel your personal responsibility for as a crimin, uh, for criminal acts of the Soviet regime. And the fourth question is, четверте питання я задам англійською мовою. Чи можете ви сказати щось про завершення The end of the culture of shame that was Я б запитую про кінець культури сорому, тому що відомо недавно culture of shame because uh, uh, recently the minister of culture has stated that we should stop thinking about what happened to us. It's the end of culture of shame. And the last question is uh, to Ukrainian representatives, we have heard about the unique experience of every country and I think that we have pr a problem with this unique experience because because uh, on the uh, security service of Ukraine, um, on the fence of uh, this social service, uh, there was some uh, like writing, some table appeared uh, that we and at this table, legitim uh, like makes uh, the scenes blurred and doesn't allow us understand, or doesn't allow us talk about co uh, some particular names, some particular per personalities who should uh, uh, be responsible for criminal actions, and uh, we should create a, a security service. Um, like not connected uh, with this criminal acts. The state uh, organs who did all these uh, problems for our societies, that was the state organs which uh, participate on, uh, on, on uh, many uh, problems we are uh, facing here. So uh, I think we cannot transfer it to private business 
We cannot uh, sell it to, to, to somebody uh, for some reason. Uh, we, have, we have to do it by the law, we have to do it fair, and we have to uh, open it for everybody, uh, for what, which was not uh, the main goal of these materials uh, before 1991, before 1989. So uh, that's, that, I think that's, this is the basic point. So, would... Я дуже коротко, власне, а в, якщо ми говоримо про Український інститут національної пам'яті, так, це державна установа, з іншого боку, все те, про те, що говорила пані Олена, про ті всі. In order that the Institute of National Remembrance uh, like, uh, created the rules of game and uh, gave the opportunity to, to the people and uh, governmental bodies to take decisions on themselves, what documents should be researched, what museums should be created. Uh, the only remark is that it shouldn't create, uh, it shouldn't uh, include any symbol, symbols connected with the Soviet regime. Uh, that is why uh, our institute, like, in fact, it uh, uh, creates uh, opportunities, but, uh, and everybody can use these opportunities as he or she wants. If uh, you let me, I would like to make some remarks as well. Mm, if we look at the Ukrainian Institute of National Remembrance, it becomes clear that it is not an academic institution and it doesn't carry out uh, historical researches and it doesn't create, uh, it doesn't product any, uh, it doesn't form, shape any official history. Uh, this institute just uh, involves different historians to create, uh, to um, establish, to create, organize some exhibitions, and to raise awareness of the society, but not to um, create its uh, own uh, uh, like right visions of history. And it is not the body which tells how we should uh, view history. I will not uh, agree with it. I haven't understood what you have told about the uh, museum. Uh, I don't agree that the uh, institute creates some, some rules. So as for the table which appeared on the security service, uh, I, uh, I uh, support the creation of memorials uh, on the sites where these repressions took place. If we talk about Kyiv and international experience concerning such sites of repressions, it is interesting for us to look at even uh, Russian memorials. If we talk about Kyiv, uh, unfortunately this topography of terror in Kyiv is not uh, so developed. If we talk about the place where uh, a lot of cr uh, criminal acts uh, took place, it is the Shafnevi Palace on, uh, near Maidan. Uh, when we talk about the uh, inner prison which existed earlier um, in this uh, part of the city, Korolenka, now it is Volodymyrska Street. So we tried to investigate the materials we have and find out what exactly, what in reality took place there. And we found out that this place, af after it was um, a jail, it was rebuilt. I know, I know history. I just, I'm just concerned with the table which wrote these gates were the, li the last uh, hope for people. I imagine that I am uh, a relative of these people and somebody took people to, to uh, security service of Ukraine and now people write that these gates were the right were this, um, the last hope for people. So, uh, 
so the place where uh, a lot of criminal acts took place uh, is now called the place of last hope. I think it's uh, uh, wrong, it's misleading. So if you know that inner prison wasn't, uh, was never a place where they died, a majority of people were taken and uh, get out of here, of there. What we can do, we can just uh, uh, commemorate uh, this place, uh, this inner uh, inner prison is uh, located uh, in the center of this uh, place of the city and we should uh, raise awareness of the society about it. So we since you cannot come uh, in inside uh, this uh, building because it is a regime, regime uh, object. Why is it regime object? It is a place of uh, criminal act. Ask so I suggest you address uh, the official government of Ukraine. Uh, she told that they do not answer. So. These gates, the gates of security service of Ukraine, uh, symbolizes a place where people were taken uh, there and people uh, had hope that something will be solved there, that their situation will be solved. And uh, in fact, uh, a small percentage of people could in fact, uh, could in fact, um, rescue from this place. It is uh, legit legitimation of uh, this severe, severe act. So let's, uh, let's imagine, I say, you and you die, you go home. I think it's not right. Okay, let's do so. Uh, if you have a list of people who were killed uh, inside this inner war, Let's uh, have a, a look at this list together and know how we can um, add names there or like work on it. If you have such possibility, okay, let's do it. So our task was to um, to tell the society that it was a maze of repression. Выпечте я надам слово для відповіді. Дякую. Your report yeah, about what you have said, and uh, there's a need for another explanation. Institute of the National Remembrance is uh, not a government body, it's independent body. Uh, so we are to be a politic too, so I cannot comment any politician or political uh, statement. Mm, I suppose that I recognize the term you have used, the pedagogy of shame. So I can say that supposedly, because I don't know this statement, mm, I, don't, I haven't heard this statement, but the term is known to me. So the pedagogy of, of shame, it's the some kind of a term uh, that means that uh, that points the instrumental use of history. So I suppose that that uh, Professor Gliński was talking about uh, about the instrumental use use of history and um, supposedly uh, he was supporting uh, art of craft. So that's all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I, I'm sorry, as I said, it's never ending story. It's a long term discussion. We will continue definitely. I believe that we will uh, even uh, continue here in, in, it, uh, in, the, in the debate. So thank you for the participants. Thank you for this very short uh, discussion. And uh, see you soon uh, here. Uh, thank you to the university, other uh, Ukrainian partners.
and also uh, I, I thank you uh, National Endowment for Democracy uh, who uh, support uh, this uh, very uh, nice uh, meeting. For us it was a very busy day, so uh, keep quiet uh, evening, you know, and, and uh, see, you, see you next time in, in, in Kiev or somewhere. Thank you very much again and uh,